What's up, guys? How's it going? Welcome. Chris Lato, a retired F-16 pilot turned UAP uh, investigator. I'm very excited about tonight's video. We have a ton of amazing guests. We'll have the first AC-130 sensor operator. He's an instructor uh, on the internet, as far as I know, at least analyzing uh, possible or UAP video. So very excited, as well as Dave Falch. Uh, he quit and then he came back. So that's awesome. Glad to have him as well as uh, Carl Vibe. Uh, he's a big time YouTuber and 3 million subs. This guy it knows what he's doing, been doing it for a long time. Happy to have him here uh, to help uh, with the show as well. Uh, and then we'll have Andy, New York UAP discussion himself, the man who uh, actually released the video. Uh, he'll be joining us later. He's, he's at work actually, so he's got to finish work. Uh, and then he will uh, be here. So uh, I just want to give a quick uh, my initial uh, basic analysis, maybe about uh, two minutes, uh, and then I will bring on the rest of the guys. So let's go through quickly. Uh, I made this. This is um, basically from Mick West, actually. Credit Mick West. Okay, so he had a decent video, actually. I mean, hand it to the guy. I mean, he's a smart dude. So he had this. Uh, he got this from Track Radar, uh, and this is the track of the plane uh, that took off from you know Tucson that time. So is most likely the plane is this irons one two uh, is the plane from the video that we'll look at which is the uh, rubber duck video okay so this is this blue track is basically the low quality track i would say for for the aircraft uh and you notice maybe it goes down into mexico here okay so maybe some issues there uh, but i asked andy if i could get some coordinates to to show how how fast this thing is going. Okay, so can I get coordinates, just three coordinates, um, early in the video, middle of the video, and then at the end of the video to show where this thing is, okay? And he gave me uh, three images uh, of those videos. And basically, if we move forward here a little bit. Uh, okay, so basically I plotted those. Basic, the first one plots over here this is a little bit better image. Uh, and that's with the aircraft right at the beginning. I'll show it later. This is the second point here uh, that plots at uh, minute 51. Uh, and then this is at 918. Okay. So basically, the plane, now this is the plane, but it's circling uh, the object. So the plane basically only goes about 5.5 nautical or regular miles. Okay. Not nautical miles. 5.5 miles uh, in 27 minutes. Um, so basically, you know, it's right around 15 miles an hour or 12 to 15 nautical miles an hour or 15 miles an hour. Okay. So basically if we take that and then we plot it. Where is that going on? Uh, you basically see right in, right in here, right in this area. Okay. So, uh, let's see if you can go back and show you. Yeah. Basically right in here, if you can see that. Okay. So if we zoom in on that area, you're going to end up, uh, with, with this. Okay. So that's basically what I showed. So 821Z, the plane's here, and then it's 851Z, it's there, and then it's there. Okay, so it's not up in the up in the west. You know, it's not up in here. Okay, uh, it's basically down in this area is where the object's traveling. Okay, so and it's traveling to the north. Uh, we checked winds for that night, and winds are calm basically. So it could be out of the east or southeast. So basically, it's uh, 15 miles per hour traveling um, from the south to the north. Uh, and I believe it's basically kind of medium altitude, you know, it's up halfway between the aircraft and, uh, the ground or somewhere in that area. Okay. And I made some DCS videos that we can go through for the rest of the video. Okay. So that's just my, uh, just initial to set the, set the stage, uh, for this, uh, live stream. So let's go ahead now and, uh, let's start bringing on our, our guests. Okay. So first one, like I mentioned, we'll go with, uh, Carl Vive, Carl Vive, man, big time YouTuber. Uh, you, you mentioned you'd like to throw in some paranormal stuff as much as you can. We're glad to have you jumping in, uh, to the UAP topic. Welcome. Uh, thanks Chris. Yeah. I'm, uh, doing all of this full time more, uh, now than ever. So it's really cool to be able to bring all my video editing skills and experience out into the field and behind the computer to try and add to this and see what we can figure out. So this is the conversation we need to have about this video. It's about time. Excellent. Yeah. And I, you did a live stream already with Andy. I watched that and you spent a lot of time 
stabilizing the video. That's it's so awesome. So really glad to have you here. And we can really, uh, you know, zoom in right on that and then ask the experts, you know, we'll bring on shortly uh, what what this what they think this thing is. OK, so speaking of next, let's bring on Dave Falch, man. Dave Falch. Welcome, buddy. How's it going? Hey, how are you doing? Thanks Good. for having me. So you're, yeah, I'm glad to have you here. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for being on the show, man. You called initially and said uh, uh, that basically you you would like to do another live stream. I said, great idea. Uh, let's do it. Um, and then you had some issues, right? Do you want to bring that up at all, or you want to mention that? Um, no, we'll just kind of. Just say I'm reformatting my social media. I think that's a good way to uh, round it out. Excellent. But you're still out there, right? Obviously, so you're here. Um, and so Dave Falch, he's a FLIR expert. He's a depot level technician. He has over 15 years um, working with these systems, these military grade cryogenically cooled systems uh, that we're going to see in this video. Um, so great to have you here, Dave. Thank you so much. And I'll give you the floor uh, shortly. Uh, let's bring in basically our final guest for this segment uh, to base to answer to Dave's uh, inputs. I guess will be Michael Saylor. Okay, so Michael Seiler. Sorry, sorry, Mike. Sorry. Uh, so I guess new to the screen at this point. So from what I understand, as uh, as DJ says, this is the first time an AC one thirty sensor operator has been online. So th thank you, Michael, for for taking the plunge and and taking a risk and and being out there with us. Welcome. Uh, th thanks for having me. Uh, glad to be here and uh, provide some inputs. Yeah. So can you give just a little bit of your background? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I did uh, fly AC-130Hs. Uh, I also flew uh, E3 AWACS as an airborne uh, uh, sensor operator. Oh, really? Cool. And then uh, once I retired, I flew um, pocket gunships in the Middle East for uh, another company. And then now I'm uh, back in training uh, Air Force uh, CISOs on operating MX-15 and uh, uh, L3 fire control systems. Excellent. And and how similar are those to you know the the system that filmed uh, the rubber duck? So the uh, IR system looks to be a mid-wave IR system. So that's similar to what we've experienced uh, with the MX-15. I'm not quite sure that this is the MX-15, but everything is pretty much the same. Okay, we can just uh, we can just uh, segue into uh, just watching the video while while you uh, while you talk about it here. Yeah, so definitely, uh, if, if you first look at the video and you just look at it, you think that the sensor operator is in white hot when he finally picks up the object. So that kind of fools you for a little bit. And you're thinking, oh, man, I, I, he's tracking this object. It's white hot. It's standing out. But, you know, obviously, the uh, truth be told, he's in black hot. So the object that we're looking at is cold, not hot. Yeah, you can tell you know, by that BH symbol down on the bottom left. That, and that that was very strange to me as well was, you know, the sparkle effects on this thing is like those bloom effects that I only remember seeing from from hot point sources. You know, I'm not used to it from from cold point sources. So that was interesting to me. Um, but yeah, excellent. Thanks for being here, Michael. Um, so back to you, Dave. Why don't uh, I'll just hand you the floor. Um, and you can bring up uh, any points while I try and find the Mylar videos. Well, right to uh, elaborate on what Michael was saying, um, I don't think this is, well, I'm, I'm sure it's not a Westcan system. It's actually its competitor. It's a FLIR system, as it says in the top left-hand corner. Um, it is a mid-wave, huh. and it's, um, yeah, it's wearing GeoPoint. Everything looks to be pretty standard, like they're just scanning the terrain, and all of a sudden here's this cold object, or objects, I should say, because there's it seems to be two distinct different objects which give it the duck-like appearance, uh, minus the neck. So something that's flying in the air that's cold that has no propulsion, it's um, you know quite an anomaly, and I. I can totally understand why the sensor operator would want to track this. 
Um, and thus it goes on for 40 minutes. We don't see anything balloon-like because mylar balloons, uh, they're kind of like mirrors. They reflect all sorts of different gradients of temperature. Um, latex balloons are pretty much see-through. Even if they're cold, they're still see-through. And um, we have some videos to take a look at about that later. But looks like you got Can some I cattle down there. <laughs> Do those? Yeah, I was going to say on another show where I was talking to Andy, we thought that these might be cows. Uh, that might be an indicator of size yeah. or something we could piece together. But okay, yeah, they're definitely large uh, livestock uh, grouped together late at night. Yeah, that'd be my guess. Yep. Yeah. It's, so basically, if you get to the the. The actual speed of the thing. Okay, so um, I've seen on a lot of other, uh, or on a few others, uh, where they talk about the speed of the, the actual uh, object is going, you know, anywhere from 90 to 200, 200 miles per hour, right? Uh, and that's based on that number up on the top right. The number on the top right, the green number there, we say, it says elevation, uh, and then right to the right of it, it says uh, speed, and then you have a uh, slant range, SLT. Um, so what's that actually telling you is the actual distance to that point on the ground, um, from what I understand. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but basically it's gonna it doesn't have a range because we never see it actually fire the laser. The operator doesn't attempt to fire the laser, at least from what we can see. Uh, and there's no actual ranging number that I that I that I see as well. That's um, correct. So I think, yeah. So basically, it's just going to the ground, right? Yeah. So. That, it, it, it's measuring point to point on the ground. So imagine a vehicle and the vehicle's moving along a road. It's measure, It's saying it starts at this point and ends at this point at a certain amount of time. And then it just brings you that feedback. But it's not based on the physical vehicle itself. It's all internal to the sensor. So there is no Doppler effect like you would get with, uh, say, a, like a cop who is... Uh, checking your speed he's getting a doppler effect off the radar he's getting the closing distance that's not how this works it's just measuring point to point on your screen as you move the sensor ball and i get and from what i understand in how every other system like this works or at least works in the in the viper is that inside the inside the system or is a, a data terrain uh, database so terrain database we call it dts uh, so basically, it, the jet or the plane in this case, the turbojet, knows where it is, and so it knows where the pot is pointing, and so all you need is that terrain data into the into the actual system, and so it it, it knows where it is. But it's just it's basically just using the model of the of the ground. So when when the sensor operator is dragging, like you see, when he's dragging across the ground there. Um, it's just, you know, if you can imagine a little, a little laser on the ground, just following along, uh, the terrain, that's what's going on. So, so the speed there is, 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 is not, is only correct if this thing is right on the ground is, is my basic point. So that speed is not going to be. Can I make a, a quick observation? You don't see anything firing on the, um, the LRF, uh, symbology on the, um, the left hand almost bottom. So usually you'll see a fire, something like that. If, if there's That's a laser, the laser, firing. Right? laser um, finder, yeah. Right, for like triangulation, you know, Pythagorean serum. So I don't see, I think what happened was they LRF'd somewhere down the road and then as they're moving around, it's just kind of compensating for the speed and, and triangulation. It's using rough measurements. So it's it's a really rough version measurement. I wouldn't consider it accurate. Um, it, it's fun to think that it's going that fast, but yeah, I don't really know. That's kind of for some, you know, engineer. You know, <laughs> what do you call an engineer that analyzes some that trigonometry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That well, so, <laughs> that, well, that's I'm I'm glad you brought that up, Dave, uh, because uh, let's see. Yeah, I just made some some videos in, D, in uh, DCS, uh, and the idea is just to get, kind of give you guys an idea of uh, what what we're actually looking at. Um, so basically, uh, this is DCS. 
so digital combat simulator uh i made a couple i made two different videos okay so one video is i'll just hit play here while i talk through it um one video is a helicopter going 15 knots okay so it's it's he's only going 15 knots uh, but he here it is right here. If you can see, there's a little blue uh, range, 5.9 nautical miles. Okay, so so this is where the helicopter is. Um, it takes me a while to lock him up. Actually, I'll have to probably just fast forward. Um, so I made this one helicopter going 15 knots up at medium altitude. So he's up at uh, uh, 7,000 feet. Um, and then I made another another video that we'll watch after this of a helicopter down low going fast. So it's a helicopter. Uh, just at, uh, it was 200 feet or I tried to get it as, as low as I could. Uh, and then he's going a uh, hundred knots. So we'll see those, those two differences and that should highlight. Um, yeah, it should make it pretty clear that we're looking at, uh, uh basically an object that's, that's medium height and not low altitude. Okay. Well, the, here's what it looks like. Can you, you guys see this? So basically we're in a left-hand orbit here, um, and, and locked off to the left side. And this is your targeting pod. So normally, when when we're flying, like in and and they do this, right? They're going they're going slower than we normally go. Okay, uh, this this the turbojet aircraft's only going 200 knots, so it's kind of hard to go that slow. I was trying to do it uh, a little bit slower, but they're going to orbit this thing. Okay, um, and and Michael, how do you guys normally orbit you know, in this kind of aircraft? So what we're doing here is. We are it's uh, good CRM, crew resource management between the sensor operator and the pilot. So what we're trying to accomplish here is a pylon turn, a standard rate left hand turn. What we're doing is, is we're telling the pilot if he doesn't have mm -hmm. steer it of uh, the sensor up front, we're telling him, hey, the target is off the left wing at uh, 270 or at nine o'clock. And what he's going to do is he's going to put the wing around the target and he's going to continue to fly in orbit around that target. And what, even though this uh, duck is moving, the pilot can still continue to orbit around it. He just extends as he goes around and around. And if you look on mm -hmm. some of the video, you will notice that the uh, sensor look angle changes. That's because the, and it looks like that the, duck moves faster that's because now the uh, duck is coming down the side of the aircraft as the pilot is now again coming back into a left-hand uh, orbit behind it hmm. so they're crossing alternate <clears throat> ways like this yes they're as doing they're, this as they're, as they're circling the target i see yeah and so here the you targets can... moving mm -hmm. he's moving with the target i see yeah, so he, here, here's the target, right? 1.7 nautical miles away, uh, and it looks like he's going, you know, he's going this direction, um, away from us. Uh, so, but you're just, you know, he's flying 15 knots, right? And and we're flying 250 knots. So as the as the the helicopter's slowly moving forward, you're just doing like this this. It's a moving a moving cap, if you will. Uh, your orbit your orbit moves with with the aircraft. And, and what you try to do as a pilot is you're going to try to maintain a certain slant range. And that'll be worked out between the pilot and this uh, sensor operator. It could be a two and a half nautical mile slant range. It could be a five nautical mile slant range. It just depends on uh, sensor. Uh, if you're trying to have noise abatement or if you're trying to stay clear of the target area and if you look at the video, you will notice that sometimes they're at three and a half miles. One time they dip in as low as two and a half miles, but most of the time they're usually about five, six miles out around the object. They're giving the object a lot of room, about six nautical miles of room. Yeah. So as we zoom in here, I just want to say, it, you know, it, it looks like the rubber duck uh, video, right? You have the ground in the background moving about the same it's going basically the same direction the whole time. This is why it kind of looks weird in that video, you know. Um, but as you see, we're turning, and that's why th that north arrow, you, you know, that north arrow up in the left side, that's that spins around because what's actually happening uh, as this thing moves is uh, it goes about five miles, 
in that uh, 27 minutes, and then the aircraft orbits it uh, nine times, uh, according to MCWEST. Uh, and so if you do that, it orbits, you know, about uh, every three minutes. So it's basically going to go around a three minute, uh, three minute wheel. But you see here, it, it still looks kind of the same from from whatever angle, right? Um, so if we go now to the low and fast helicopter uh, here, Okay, so what you're going to see is it's it, it, the aircraft that we're in is not going to be able to do a normal orbit, right? And I even had to speed up to like 300 knots um, because if it's going 100 knots, right, then when you're going with it, if you're only going 200 knots, it's going to slow down a lot, right? It'll be uh, half your speed. Um, but then when you're going the other direction, it's going to be going three times faster, right? So you'll see the background. You'll see different. It's going from different angles, right? Um, and then you, you, so you'll see this angle will change. Uh, and then, yeah, you'll also see that it will have to speed up and slow down how the ground passes in the background uh, when you're going with the aircraft, you know, with this uh, helicopter down low going fast and when you're going the opposite direction as you're orbiting it. Um, and yeah, I've, you know, I've lost convoys. I was supposed to follow a Humvee, you know, um, in, in Iraq and I lost it because it's hard to, to, this moving cap is very difficult uh, to actually orient, right? So that's- You're basically idea. trying to follow a moving object uh, that's not on the ground, but at a distance in the sky, plus while you're circling it like a vulture from overhead at a completely higher rate of speed than it's moving. So you're talking about a lot of adjustments on the fly, literally. It, yeah, and, and really why I missed it is uh, you have to re- my system, I lost track, right? And when I went to break lock, it went back to the very original point where I started tracking them. And from there, it's gone. And, and I look outside, you look out here like now, like, okay, find the truck out there. You know, it's like, I mean, you have some general idea, but it's really difficult in a city. It's like, you know, almost impossible. So um, yeah, anyway, I wanted to show that uh, just to, uh, it seemed, seemed cool anyway. Uh, okay, so Dave, I was able to download uh, your video here i got a couple set up which one did you want to show first no it doesn't matter ah okay so we'll just go through some of your mylar balloon videos you want to talk through them and i'll, I'll just keep playing them yeah this is sure yeah this is one it's just a normal latex balloon like a you know bag of balloons that you get at a dollar store um, I pulled this one out of the freezer. That's why it looks a little bit more black. But I wanted to illustrate that you can still see through it. This is, out of, it's been in the freezer for like two hours. So it's going to show, you know, that it's cold. But I wanted to illustrate that it's still, you know, somewhat transparent. Uh, within about a minute or two, it started to um, become invisible again because mid-wave IR just sees through latex. I don't know why. It's just an observation. Um, and the, like I was telling you earlier on the Mylar balloons that um, they're like floating mirrors. They just reflect all sorts of, you can see the hot on the bottom, the cold of the sky. And as a Mylar balloon is going to turn, you see all these little creases and everything. It, wow. It's tumbling in the sky like this. You're going to get all sorts of weird different gradients okay. of color. Uh -oh. Sorry about that. Go ahead. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. I got you now. Can you do that again? I'm sorry, man. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm just going to yeah. say, as a mylar balloon is tumbling through the sky, you're going to get all sorts of weird colors, gradients of the heat. So you're going to see, you know, a little bit of glint of, um, of the ground, mostly the sky because you're up above looking down upon it. But you're still going to see other... Um, temperature gradients, unlike the rubber duck, which is just one solid cold source, which I've talked to a couple of pilots and they said it's not a mylar balloon because you're able to to see, you know, the different reflections. Yeah, I think I have a better one of the mylar balloon here. Let's, uh, let's bring this up. Is, or is this the same one? Yeah. I'll try one more. Here we go. That's the frozen balloon you used? Yeah. 
Yeah, I just threw it in the freezer. Okay, and then you had one more video. Sorry, guys. Give me one second to not look like an idiot. Uh, one more time. Okay, this is the Mylar one. Yeah, again, that's outside, so I just kind of smack it around a little bit to show you. What are these? This is the MSI degrees? G yeah. Yeah, that's the temperature, Fahrenheit. Under the sensor, I guess, or? Yeah. Right. I was using a FLIR 1 handheld sensor like Mick has. So, um, you know, I'm just coming up to it. It's not good resolution. It's, you know, just analog as far as I'm concerned, 640 by 480, something like that. But you're basically going to see a lot of, of different reflections and effects is what, that's your main argument, right? Yeah, exactly. Even viewed from above, it's not going to remain a consistent uh, cold source. You're going to see different things happen. Would you agree and, with yeah, that, so Michael? That, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, there, there is, I, I do agree with that. Um, there is one thing, though, depending on how long this balloon, if we're saying this balloon was flying, what happens is, especially at night, we know that this is at night, early in the morning in November, so it's cold. What happens sometimes is, is that the temperature of the balloon equals the temperature of its surrounding area. And basically what that may uh, ha uh, cause is for the balloon itself to disappear. It's really there, but it's uh, blending in with the background. Uh, we, we have that uh, happen a lot during uh, sunrise and sunset. We call that the inversion uh, zone. So what we do is we teach our students that they need to change their uh, sensor settings so that they can break stuff out because everything is blending together. So, and also you have uh, the balloon pretty close to you. And uh, I, if you put it further out, it might be harder to see as well. So the idea that this is a uh, solid white object for 20 minutes on camera over this time without any fluctuation would be anomalous, you would say? What? What I think maybe is, is that the, if, if the balloon is there, it may have got cold soaked. And once it got cold soaked, it equaled the temperature of the air surrounding it. And it would tend to uh, get inversion or blend in, if you would. Mm -hmm. Carl, can you, I, I think this is a good time to show your, uh, your stabilized video. Sure. Let me uh, yeah, switch over awesome. to that one. Here, I'll pop this off and pull the other one up. Cool. Oh, man, we got tons of comments. There we go. <laughs> What's up, guys? Everyone in the comments, hey, thanks, guys, for being here. Seriously, uh, I'll definitely read them later. <laughs> so hopefully no one's being terrible. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. So the first 10 minutes of this is just the regular footage, but what I've done is locked it in so the object stays dead center on screen and all the camera shake is basically isolated around the, the target itself. And then after that, after the first 10 minutes, it zooms in so we get a closer view. And then there's uh, 10 minutes after that where it's zoomed in and uh, slowed down 30%. So there is a little bit of instability because when it goes over the white areas where it blends in the software loses its ability to track and i have to do it frame by frame manually which is 30 frames a second so it takes a long long time <laughs> in some of these areas but um yeah so now you can see the targets locked right in the middle of the screen and everything else has to adjust around it yeah, excellent. Thanks, thanks for doing that, man. Um, so, I guess, uh, w w what do you think, Dave? C you know, what's your impressions of could it be a could it be balloons first? I guess first question, and then could it be drones? I think those are the two main possibilities. Yeah, well, the, the balloons is you know the more likely of the two because drones are going to generate heat. 
uh, they're not going to appear cold like this. And if they somehow do manage to make them cold, it's kind of a moot point because it's still a detectable object. So I think they'd be smart in that and try to, you know, disguise it some other how, some other way if it were a drone. Um, balloon is the more likely thing, but the reason I can't agree with that is just because it's so cold. Even if a mylar balloon were to assume an ambient temperature of let's say 55 degrees or you know whatever the temperature was, um, it's been my experience that a mylar balloon, uh, the mirror quality uh, overrides the coldness. So I've taken mylar balloons out uh, from a freezer again, out and uh, videotaped them, and they reflect more than you see the cold. It's it's an override is the reflection from my experience. What's your point, Michael? We were, we were talking yesterday. Um, you know, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So what, what I think it is um, right before the sensor operator picks up the object, he raises the camera to the West, to the sky. He is looking up in the sky. And then he brings it down, and about a minute later, he picks up the object that just runs through the bottom right uh, quadrant of his screen. I personally, what I think is they knew the object was coming. I think what it was was a, a balloon that went up. If uh, you know some things about balloons, when they send them up, they explode when they're high. And then what they do is they have a parachute, and they come down on the parachute. So we never see the parachute, we never see the balloon, but what I think you're looking at is a metal payload that sits at the end of that string. And on mm. top of that, it on top the bottom piece is gonna be your payload. On top of that is another uh, piece of equipment that is the GPS receiver that allows whoever is tracking it to track it. The reason why it's so cold is usually these boxes are made of metal. And so as it ascended to, 90,000 feet, 100,000 feet, whatever it was, depending on the size of the balloon, it got super cold soap going up. And so as it's falling down to the earth, as it goes through the troposphere, the stratosphere, the, the atmosphere, you know, warms, cools, warms, cools until it gets back down to where we are. And now the air is warm, but that metal box is still super cooled from being so high. And that's why you see it so well with your sensor. Also, if you notice, the sensor operator never, ever, since he picks up the object, changes his focus, changes his contrast. He doesn't even uh, zoom in or zoom out. He is specifically in the medium field of view of this IR camera system, and he never changes. It's as if he's either a afraid of losing it or he doesn't want to uh, it to be recorded, whatever it is. Another thing I also noticed is that the if you look at the bottom left hand corner, it says HDIR. So that would most typically mean high definition IR. Obviously, if you look at the video, it's not IR. So that could be a post. Um, uh, what do you mean? It's not IR I, I don't it, it, because it's very pixeled. It's not a very clear screen. You're, oh, you mean it's not HD? It's not high right. depth. Yeah, yeah I'm okay. sorry. HD, yeah. yes. You're not seeing the, as clear as a picture as a sensor operator. So everyone may be like, oh, it's flashing a lot. That's pixelation blur. Basically, what you're having is you see a lot of pixels. As the pixels go through the object, they're dragging. Those pixels drag, and it makes it look like it's uh, shining or transmitting or super hot. This box... In my, in my theory, is spinning uh, on that shoot. It's not stabilized. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gives you that wobbly look. And then as the pixels go through that, you get that brightness. But that's, I think that's what it is. What we're looking at is the tail end of a parachuted payload that was sent high up in a balloon. Yeah. That's what, very plausible. <laughs> what do you think, Dave? But I mean, for the 40 minutes, how does it fly in a straight line for 40 minutes? It, it, you mean it's it's basically it got to a equilibrium point at, at that altitude, like that temperature, and then it continued. Is is that the your point, Michael? I guess oh. I don't understand. Yeah, is it coming? How does it uh, how does it uh, stay up for 
for 40 minutes or yeah, 40, almost 40 minutes. That is a good question. So maybe it's <laughs> no, no. a steerable parachute. You know, the, uh, the military does have GPS steerable parachutes for payloads. Uh, this so could like a be drug one runner. of those. Yeah. What, what do you think, Dave? Is that possible that it could be some sort of balloon? Uh, I didn't mention I sized, uh, I did size it, right? So if you know the speed, if we know the rough speed um, going 15 miles per hour, uh, then we can get a rough estimate of the uh, altitude. So I estimate it was basically halfway in between. Uh, and then I measured it over uh, basically a, few, a couple roads. Uh, I got it was basically eight feet long at the ground, right? So if you go eight feet long at the ground, that was at 2.8 nautical miles. Uh, and it's halfway in between. So it's around three to four feet. So that, that's what I calculated uh, is, is that altitude. So it's three to four feet across uh, that whole thing. Um, hmm. so what do you think, Dave? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I would think that you would see some kind of tethering or something if it were a descending object or even an object floating for 40 minutes. I mean... I can assure you that it is an IR. It's an HD. It's it's definitely high def IR. It looks kind of grainy because the auto gain, auto level, um, it doesn't have anything that jumps out. So it's just you know just doing its auto adjustments. Um, the fact that the object is obviously distinct in the video tells me it's a significance, a significant co uh, cool coolness. Um, I agree with Michael. It could be something metal. It, I, I just don't think it's a balloon. Um, and I, I like his I, I hypothesis, his ideas. You know, any ideas are welcome. But um, I don't know. I think you would see it if it was just um, clinging on to something through a string or, or some type of lanyard, then it, you would see that. Um, don't know. Yeah, I it to me it just doesn't it doesn't move it doesn't move like a balloon you know it um yeah but again i don't think it moves like a balloon to me it moves more like a you know a controlled object like a drone uh or something of that nature is what it felt like to me you know um andy so, from that ufo podcast he sent me a uh, a picture you know is this what it is i, I tried to uh, send it but it's basically just a um the batteries on the top of a drone um you know, you have a few drones, Dave. Do you think this could be a a drone? Um, if it, it could be if it were black, but it's white, so <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, that's a great point, yeah. right? I mean, how do you answer the cold? I mean, that's I don't know, Michael. But the only way you answer the cold is by it. it it's a metal object that got cold soaked. Hmm. And that's why it's super cold. Um, I'll say this. Um, when I was uh, flying overseas, we would have aerostats up. And we would be looking at them six to eight miles out, uh, especially when we were going over certain areas because we wanted to find them, right, because we didn't want to run into them. I could always see the aerostat itself, which is just like a balloon. Think of like a, a Hindenburg, but a lot smaller. And then you would never see the teether line. So that was the most scariest thing was that teether lines would always bow. And so you 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 knew where the aerostat was, but you never knew where the teether line was. Yeah, and we, we talked before maybe about focus, you know. So I was asking, uh, you know, where is this thing focused? Could it be possibly be out of focus because it's closer uh, and we're focused to the ground? Is that is that possible? So, so um, if you watch the video from the beginning, the uh, sensor operator nukes the ball, which means he's trying to clear, calibrate the IR sensor. Right, to maybe the we can go to that. Uh, do you have the time, Michael, of that? Uh, is that when he basically looks up? Uh, I think we checked it yesterday. No, that was very from the beginning at uh, 0821Z on the... Um, okay, yeah, I think Carl start money with that thing. He can... And then what he, what else he does is you will actually see him mess with the contrast, the brightness. He messes in the beginning. It, he changes fields of views. He doesn't change out of black hot though. He stays oh. black hot the whole flight. But but he does change the settings in the beginning. 
it's almost like they they strapped it on to the plane and and they didn't have all of the capabilities. You know, have you you've so, I'm sure come across that Michael where you just don't get all the the you know all the little cables don't have a, a corresponding link so you just yes. don't maybe they couldn't so, change. Cuz so I, I yeah, my impression should, is he's not military trained. You know, that's my impression because I would be I would be changing polarities like crazy and zooming in. You know, I think he's overtasked maybe focused in um, so. and, and uh, the the other uh, piece missing here is we don't find you know what happens at termination. Does it hit the ground? Is someone waiting for it? We we kind of just leave it while it's still in the air. The other thing the 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 airplane is suspected to be a RC twenty six Bravo, uh, which is a, a Fairchild aircraft that was modified for reconnaissance. And prior to about 2017, there were already talk about trying to replace the sensors because they were starting to get outdated. And this may have been one of those outdated sensors. There, there was talk about how the aircraft had limitations. It was getting outdated. Uh, it didn't meet the needs that the uh, National Guard needed for these aircraft. So this might be one of those old ones. And maybe that is a limitation that it's only in black hot. Yeah, I have it right here. I'll just uh, real quick borrow this. This is your, it's a Metro liner, right? That's what yes. uh, we mentioned yesterday. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, cool, send back to you. Yeah, so. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I was just gonna throw out a couple of points. Um, Totally agree. It's in a narrow field of view right there, as you can see in the middle. The bottom, um, I'm sorry, in the bottom left, it has a W and an N. You're in the middle, so you're in the narrow field of view. Um, yeah, he should have, he or she should have uh, zoomed in on the object, changed polarities, focused, done a, a whole variety of different things. Why they chose to um, just remain at that static position, I don't know. Um, and uh, uh, Michael, you made a good point that, um, you know, we don't see the ending of this. We just see uh, a specified time period of, of the 40 minutes. So it, it's hard to judge based on that. You know, I like to see a conclusion to things. Um, it just kind of looks like they were bored. And they saw this thing and they didn't, they just recorded it and they maybe were there fascinated by it and they didn't do any kind of alterations. But that's the first thing I always do is make all sorts of adjustments with uh, the, the IR camera, which would be the only applicable camera at this point because it's at nighttime. Yeah. So, so imagine, imagine you're the air crew, you spot this thing, you, you're going to go sensor crazy. Your pilot's going to tell me, Hey, Mike, you need to identify that object. And I'm going to, push my sensor in, I'm going to push all the way out so I can get a wide view without losing it. And then I'm going to change my polarities. I'm going to change my focus. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I can, my contrast, so I can break this thing out and get a good PID or positive identification of what this object is. Because at this point, it could be a threat to the aircraft and they're watching from a distance and they don't know what it is. So if that was me flying, I would definitely be what I call sensor happy, just constantly moving my sensor, trying to trying to break that uh, piece of equipment out. Is there any data or indicators on the screen or the heads up display or anything that would tell us what the zoom is at or where he's got it set? If he is zoomed all the way in and just not Maybe. backing off or? Yeah, it, it's on the bottom left corner, you'll see the N and the W. So that's narrow and wide. Yeah. And as he zooms the sensor in and out, you'll see it go to the W for wide or N for narrow. And then in between, he's in between like medium. In the beginning of the video, uh, when they're first flying, you actually see him zoom out and zoom in. And then you can watch that W move in and out. Also, there's a focus button that he's using to focus the uh, system. And you can see that changed as well. Um, it's called the FOC and it's on manual right now. So he probably has a trim wheel that he can trim the focus for the ball. And then you see it says exposure auto. So he can make the exposure dark or lighter. And he does that in the beginning with the system. I see. 
Yeah, so then, so basically the, the balloon is the ants, the only possibility for that because of the temperature, uh, because a drone would be putting out some sort of heat is, is the, is the basic main problem with the drone, with the drone argument that I see, you know, is, is the temperature. And this is the middle of the night. You mentioned an important kind of interesting point. I just thought of Michael is, is how do you think they, they saw this thing? You know, how did they first, uh, lock onto it? Um, what was your impression? When I first saw it, he pulled the sensor to the sky to the west. Okay, what, yeah, what was what time was that? Let's go look at that. I think that may be kind of an important That point. was at uh, 20 minutes and 42 seconds in the video itself. So that's, oh, right when they see it. Yep, so right before they see the, the object. A minute before, so at 1902. Okay. Yeah, and we talk because this is the middle of the night, right? So it's basically yeah. oh, right there. There he is. He's yeah. looking in the I sky see. to the west, right there. And, and we mentioned the vegetation, right? It's going to be warmer than the background as well because the right. you know the vegetation is it's this is a November in Tucson. It gets cold out there in the desert. Yes, yeah, so the vegetation is going to uh, emit less uh, emissivity or radiation because that's what we're really looking at for the IR. The the, the big myth out there is it's looking for heat we're not looking for heat every object in the world uh, has a missivity level and what we're doing is we're uh, emanating our energy and so plants are trying to store their heat keep warm so they're emitting less than rocks rocks don't care right so they're gonna they're gonna uh, let all their emissivity go out and that's why you can see the vegetation is warmer than the rocks it, and the and water that, as that well helps. right yeah the yeah, water has, you know, it can't freeze. So, yeah. So that that's the right there. He's looking at the sky, and he's looking out towards the west. And then a minute later, minute and a half later, so you see the W there in the center of your screen. That's the direction the sensor is looking. So right now he's looking out to the west, and then the uh, two the top, yeah. circles on the uh, bottom of the screen there, left and right. Let's the sensor operator know where his sensor is looking in relation to the aircraft and his look down angle. Uh, but it, I checked uh, the look down angle is is related to the plane uh, from from everything I could check. So basically, if the plane's in a turn, that look down angle will stay the same. <laughs> you know, if the plane turns, the look down angle on the screen will be the same, but the but the image will move at least. Yeah. Is what so I, what yeah. I saw. So their look down angle is not that he's not looking directly down because they're between three and a half to five miles from the object. So he's not going to look down at the object. He's going to look to the object. Well, it's just not it's not to the horizon, right? Because right. like, look, it's one degrees down. But, you, you know, the horizon is obviously, you know, quite several degrees up. Yes, correct. OK, so when they find it, the question is, do you think the pilots saw this thing? You know, if it's at night, you know, so it, did they it, see it and tell the sensor operator to, to lock it so right there. Yeah. It is um, it originally when it comes through, originally it comes through the bottom right uh, corner. And um, I don't know if he was specifically looking for it or not. So this is a military aircraft. So the pilots may have been on MVDs, night vision devices. They, they might have had those. They might have caught something. Uh, we don't know what the uh, moon illumination for that uh, uh, time frame was, or at least I don't, I should say. So it could, it's in the middle of nowhere, so it's going to be totally dark. So it's going to be hard for the pilots to pick it out. But from the way he looked up, and then he's searching that area as the balloon came through, I personally think they knew they were looking for it. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, if they if they didn't, if they did not have MVGs or MVDs, then how would they see it? You know, unless it was self-illuminated, that's kind of interesting. I, but I think if it was self-illuminated, they would have followed it longer, probably. Um, yeah. And the, the other thing, too, is um, I try to look. So there is a laser pointer on the aircraft. So that's an IR pointer. Um, it never fires it, as far as I can tell. I, I never see it go off and that would, would help the pilots stay on orbit because it would give them a direct line of sight to, to the object, what the sensor's looking at. 
Now up front, they may have a SADS for the pilots to look at so they could actually see where their sensor's pointing. And so what uh, they're gonna do like we do, how we train the pilots today is they're gonna fly around those points and they're gonna put the left wing to that SADS where the sensor's looking. So the pilot, he can see the sensor normally? Normally, yes. There's a repeater up front so he can see what the sensor's seeing. And yeah. also, he, he's going to get some uh, some kind of indication exactly the look angles of the sensor. That's where he finds it, right there. Hmm. It's, yeah, it's, I have uh, I found the uh, the weather, so we can. Uh, I'll just steal real quick. So this is from uh, Weather Underground, uh, Tucson International Airport Station, November twenty third, twenty nineteen. Uh, and basically, if you look down here in the in the morning, it's six to eight miles south southeast, so out of the south southeast, which is basically the the basic direction that this thing is traveling to the to the north. Does it have a moon illumination on there by chance? Uh, it, it, I can find it somewhere else. It says waxing gibbish <laughs> gibbous. Uh, it okay. rises at three, so no, you're not going to have your moon. So it's going to be a dark night. Okay. Until three. Until three. So the end of. Uh, yeah, to to the end of their sword. This is nine Z minus seven, so two. Yeah, so it'll be an hour. It doesn't rise until an hour after they. Uh, yeah. After this is recorded, so it's going to be dark. Um. So that yeah. Um. My own impression was they just kind of he just kind of saw it and tracked onto it, but I'm curious what you what you would say um, in that case. So that's that's kind of interesting. Um. Excellent. So then could it be and the, the last thing I was thinking of was uh, a, a balloon that's powered? <laughs> could you have a balloon that just has a, a light power behind it? I, I don't know. But either way, how, how is it cold? I, it just doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. So, so we know that we have balloons that have GPSs on them that can steer for position uh, airdrops. Um, maybe that's what's being used here. I think if, it, if it's a high altitude uh, balloon, the balloon pops as it, as it reaches, ascends to all the way to however high it's going to ascend. And usually they have parachutes. What we're not seeing, it would be like a, a jump or a sportsman parachute. We're not seeing the parachute only because the sensor operator never changes his field of view for whatever reason. Um, I, I should have saved that picture that I showed you yesterday of the balloon with the payload. And you could see where you would have a large object underneath and then a tiny object on top to give you that duck look. Hmm. Yeah, I can send those here in a second. as well and let's see what time is it do we have uh andy when is andy coming on he gets off work at at uh six so i don't know maybe he's uh, got some issue i and incidentally i talked to um i talked to gary Voorhees today uh from uapx um uh, you know about some other things but possibly working uh, and he, I asked him, you know, it, what do you think it is? I'm doing the live stream tonight. And his, uh, his, he said, uh, you know, he, on the record, if he had to guess, he would say it's a drone carrying a payload, a gas powered drone, uh, is what he said. Um, but again, the, the temperature, right. And Michael, so, uh, you were mentioning something like that's not the temperature. Uh, so right. how, how does it get that temperature? How does it, how does this system, uh, as far as you know, actually figure out the temperatures in these things? So we're not even looking at temperature. If you wanted to know the temperature of this object, you would need a, a, a thermal imager. Think of firefighters. When they go into fight a fire, they have those thermal imager, uh, imagers that tell them how hot something is. Newer IR systems have that capability. They will overlay uh, heat thermal um radiation in color over an IR picture. But what we're not looking, we're not really looking for heat. We're looking for emissivity. We're looking for what is radiating, radiating off that object. 
every object radiates something. And th there is one, the, the, the black mass, that doesn't radiate, it just absorbs all its energy. And so what we're looking for are the contrasts between the different objects, and that's what gives us our thermal image. So don't think of it as heat. It's, that, it's called infrared, not heat red. And so we're looking for that infrared energy uh, emissivity at different um, rates than the objects surrounding themselves. So that's why you get the vegetation, the rocks, and everything at different temperatures, or in this case, you know, different uh, shapes so you can make them out. Why don't we see anything like a parachute tether or a parachute or any strings, ropes, anything, any kind of differentiation in the temperature? Like if this is a satchel that's wrapped in cables yeah. or a metal box, where's the strapping or the buckles or the, or the padlocks or anything? It's literally just a solid cold yep. object with no ropes or tethers or parachute or anything. So. Easy to explain. So we're at about six, five to six nautical miles out. So 30,000 feet away from this object. We're probably using a system like the MX-15 or FLIR 360. So those systems, while very capable and very good, they're not going to see the small minute string or rope or cable. It's just, it's just not going to show up at that distance. The individual buckles, unless they're flying off, you're not going to see them either. So here's the picture I was talking about, right? So you have the balloon, it ascends, that balloon pops, you see the parachute there. And then you can see the rigging, which even on this visual picture, you're not, you can't see the rigging very well. And then you have your payload on the bottom. And so what we're seeing, if you can imagine from where it says the rigging down, that's what we're seeing in that IR picture. We're not seeing above that for whatever reason. How is it floating though? I don't know. He, well, like we're seeing parachute. through it. It's on yeah. a parachute and it, you know, winds aloft and it's, you know, there's no like jumper him. there to collapse the parachute to allow it to descend. Um, or it could be a GPS guided, mechanically guided parachute, and it's uh, directing itself through GPS. <laughs> I don't know, but that sounds sounds crazy. It's it's crazy, but if you look at soft jumpers, they have them. That's how that's how they do precision jumps. So, oh, I see. But they but they have to land. You know, I don't know how how would it float. I don't know. For 40 well, minutes. This would land easily. It would just crash into the ground. Yeah. And hopefully it's sturdy enough that the data, whatever data it was contained or holding, is able to um, survive the impact. Think of it as the black box, right? A black box survives yeah. how many Gs crash? Yeah. But, I mean, if you look at... Uh, at you know, when it, when it's, when it's flying, I mean, there's not high winds. Um, you know, I just showed the winds six knots uh, at the ground. Right. So it could be higher. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, you know, you're not talking very high winds. Um, so I don't know that how is, it would stay afloat. That is, that, a, that's the million a, dollar question there. Yeah. There's a particular uh, spot here where it's over some roads and it looks like cattle guards and a few things it, like that. Towards you, the you, end can of the see, you can also see, you can also, Oh, sorry, man. Yeah. Uh, you can also see wind effects in the pod. Um, but all, all right, man, I think he's off from work. So we got him in. Let's uh, get Andy, New York UAP. Um, I, personally, I just want to give a special thanks to Andy. I mean, dude, he does this stuff uh, in his spare time after his, after his job, right? He, he had his job. Uh, and that's why he was late to this and doesn't make any money, right? He's demonetized his video. Um, so... Yeah, I don't know. I think he's gotten way too much, way too much hate. And I just want to say thanks for putting out this video and the A10 video uh, and the and the Bruja video that, that we'll show in a second. So with that said, thanks. Uh, let's bring on Andy. Let me how's it going, man? Welcome. What's up, guys? Yeah, oh, welcome. Well, rushing to get here. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, man, for being here. Thanks for releasing the video. Um, no you know, I know it's gotten controversy. Etc. But at the end of the day, it's just 
it's more documented stuff. Even if it, even if it doesn't turn out to be a UAP, uh, it, it, well, it's still anonymous in all, in all respects, but thanks for releasing this video and the other two, man. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank, no problem. Appreciate it. And that one thing I want to mention, I never once stated that this was a UFO or some kind of extraterrestrial thing. I said it was anomalous. So yep. people are kind of jumping to, you know, to conclusions with that when I made it very clear. Yeah. Excellent. I mean, the, dude, we're online. There's always going to be haters. You're always <clears> gonna have some people that don't like your style or the, or the words you use. Um, but you know, I, I think you're in it, um, for the right reasons. Uh, and you've released these awesome videos, man. So I hope we continue to, to get more videos, uh, in the future. So what, what's your take, man? Basically up until this point, we've looked through, um, I think it's medium altitude. I uh, basically showed through these DCS videos um, that it's it's not close to the ground going fast, um, and it's going around 15 miles per hour. Uh, we we looked through the, probably the biggest thing against drones is that it's cold, man. The object shows up cold. It's it's obviously black hot. I you know when Michael uh, when he first looked at the video um, initially he thought it was in white hot, you know, which makes sense. It looks like a like a hot object based on the you know the pixelation. Um, but what we found is it, it is in black hot. You know, you can look at the trees, you can look at the engine. Um, so it's there's even there's even game tra like game trails visible on the ground right here. I still don't see any cables or parachute tethers or ropes or. Well, I, I actually caught some of, while I was driving here. Um, so here's here's the thing with that. Um, so the footage was placed in this folder with the other two files because the individuals that you know were involved with those incidents could not identify what it was and that was the uh basically what what the source had told me and the reason why he you know knew that i would be interested in them because he knows the pilots he knows the individuals that were in that plane at that time and they couldn't they couldn't identify what it was i think what dave falch mentioned was uh, correct that the object may have, you know, like captured their attention and they were just like in awe as, as to what it was. Um, whether it's, you know, something man-made is, is, you know, it's, it's up for debate, but I don't think it's a balloon because, you know, if it was, then that means they would have had the end result of wherever it landed and they would have found the drugs or wherever, whatever it was. But um, apparently, I believe it cut off because they just couldn't, you know, they couldn't continue tracking this thing. And I guess they had other things to do. I don't know. But um, that would be my, that's that's my conclusion to the, you know, if it was a balloon, then they would have found where it landed because a balloon's got to come down somewhere. You know what I'm saying? And that's their job. So if it was drugs and they just let that go, then I guess they're not doing a very good job. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that didn't make sense to me either. Because if they're tracking this, let's say they think it's a balloon. I mean, obviously they they he thinks it's an object, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. if he's tracking it, it's just crazy to me that they would they would just leave it. You exactly. Know? Uh, unless they said, "Hey, I really don't. I think that's just well. Even if you think it's a balloon, right? It's coming from the south. <laughs> if your job is, you know, catching drug smugglers, why that's would the they thing. just leave it? Um, it they, yeah, exactly. It, did he mention your, did the source mention, um, you know, what you said, how they got the video. Uh, but you've also mentioned another time that they went back, you know, they were looking for the a 10 video, uh, and they found, was that the Bruja? Was that Bruja? They found that. Uh, well, no, well, the, the a 10 video, um, all of these, all of those incidents were, were, uh, I think filmed by different, you know, uh, individuals. Yep. The, a the a10 video I know that um from what he told me that um Air Force was interested in the footage and they did get take a copy of it direct from the um from the truck that was being you know that that was being used at the time and the Bruja footage I know me and Dave have been you know going back and forth with this and you know the the source agrees with it as well um if you look at that footage and then you look at that object, they're damn near identical in every way. You understand? Yeah. Even, even the small little object that you see that that has like you know, uh, like there's nothing in between it. You can see right through it. You could actually see that there also. But in this in this footage, the object is moving linear. It's not moving in any kind of you know way like a balloon would move or something like that. You know what I'm saying? And actually, at one point, slows down. And um, 
you know, it just, it, it, it's weird. It's an, it's a, it's an odd object, you know? So when they spotted that one, they also had no, I, you know, there was no explanation for what it was, but it was enough to capture them and put it in that folder and have everybody look at it, trying to figure out what, what is this? What are we looking at? You know? Yeah, I guess, and this is La Bruja or the witch. Um, so Andy's also released this video and this video looks, you know, after watching the rubber duck video, it looks kind of similar. You know, it looks like a similar, at least the 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 IR signature uh, is is kind of similar, except reverse. Now you have like a little ball on the bottom, and then you have this kind of weird thing uh, moving moving on the top. Um, I don't. What, what was your take on this, Michael? What? So when I first saw it, I thought maybe it was an object on a sled being pulled across the terrain out in the middle of nowhere. Obviously, that doesn't make sense. Um, I didn't think it looked like the rubber duck at all. I think they're two totally different objects. I don't believe they're the same. Yeah. And obviously this one is ground level versus, uh, flying quote unquote. Um, so I came to the conclusion it was probably, a, a, something on the ground, not similar to the flying duck and, the only question I had is, is the polarity. I believe they're in black hot again. It, that's but, what I guess too, just from, again, the saguaros, the vegetation. Yeah. You know, if you look at these, you know, these are saguaros. I, I flew a lot in, in uh, Tucson. Uh, you know, these go anywhere from like, you know, 20 up to 70 feet, I think is the height uh, of a saguaro. But, you know, uh, I think after 70 years, they, they start growing their extra limbs. Um, so this guy's probably like, you know, 20 feet. So the, w one of the reasons why I, I was saying that it, you know, it does resemble the rubber duck is because if you look at the, if you look at the rubber duck footage and, um, you know, the stabilization, when you speed it up and you kind of go back and forth, you could see that the object is actually rotating and, and making complete full rotations, which that was the oddest part, which why I, I was saying it can't be a drone because, a drone wouldn't be able to do that. You understand what I'm saying? If it's pulling a payload, then that's it. The, you know, the, the, the heavier part has to be at the bottom. It can't rotate that. You know what I'm saying? Just impossible. Um, but if you look at the Bruja, that piece, again, like I was mentioning, is actually at the bottom part, and it also rotates as well. And at points, you could see that there is a, uh, a space in between the larger object and the smaller object as well. That was the only reason why, you know, like, for example, when I was speaking with Dave, I was saying, do you, you know, it kind of has some similarities because, you know, you could you could see that, you know, it does have two parts only in that in the Bruja footage. It's kind of in a different location. But when you go back to the rubber duck, it's rotating. So it's possible that, you know, at a regular normal flight, it's how that's how it, you know, it, 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 it positions itself, I guess. You know what I'm saying? But another thing you got to consider is, let's just say hypothetically, this isn't anything of ours. It's not some kind of drone. It's not a balloon. It's not anything like that. It's an actual unknown, right? We're not going to understand what we're looking at. We're going to try it. We would sit here forever trying to make sense of what it is that we're looking at. You know what I'm saying? And what if there really is no detail? What if what you're looking at is is exactly you know, what, what the object is? You know what I'm saying? And it's possible, you know what I mean? So, you know, to say to say it's a balloon definitively is kind of stretching, you know, because like I said, if, if it was, then it would be something that would be easily identifiable. It would have to fall somewhere. And then the footage would have just gone into the ocean of other footage that everybody's, you know, at DHS has probably uh, figured out or whatever or they had a conclusion for. But my thing is the fact that it was placed in this file and people, you know, it, it went around the, 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 I guess you could say like the office trying to get people to identify what it could be. That's where, you know, I kind of drew my conclusion that the object is anomalous hmm. because hmm. they, they, nobody could identify it. You know, everybody was mystified, but they were looking at. It. Yeah. I don't, and can you tell at all what system this is, Michael or, or Dave, any ideas? In the Bruja, yeah, that's, that's the same type of system. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's the same type of system. I conclude that just by looking at the symbology. 
Okay, awesome. So that's another high definition system from FLIR. Um, personally, this is my favorite. I love this one because it just makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, look at the cattle down there. It's got to be at least around cattle size, and it kind of flows down a little bit and then starts to gain some more traction. And it remains kind of at like a level, um, doesn't increase in elevation. It just remains at an even keel. It's really freaky. That's another thing. Just, that, that's actually really important, too, because if it was a drone, right, at night, you would have seen some kind of reaction from the cattle, you know, it would have spooked them, you know. So that was one thing that definitely told me it was it was 100% not a drone. It looks like the same object to me. I don't know if I'm just crazy. Um, Actually, if you go, go back to what, what night was that? What was the day for that? Let's get the weather on Bruja. I haven't. If you go, if you go back a little, you could actually see the the the, the second object, you know, and and actually the space in between the two. I don't. Yes. There's a part. There's a part where you 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 can actually clearly see the second piece, and it's also rotating as well. Let's see. Yeah, it's so weird, but it's almost just floating the same way, you know. Mm -hmm. It looks kind of the same. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you would see wind effects, actually, because it looks really dark. I think that's why you're getting. Uh, but it's in IR. That's weird. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you can't right tell. Right there, it even slows down. Right? Okay, you see, like, right around here, you'll start seeing the, sep the second part. Hold on. There you go. You see it right there? It's two parts. You see the smaller piece at the bottom, the larger at top. It's it's clear. I like I, I, on my phone when I look at it, it's super clear. But you could right there, you can see like there's like this right towards the center is like a darker area that 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 appears. Yeah, maybe I can zoom in. Yeah, yeah. This one's so weird. What do you remember the date of this one? Uh, maybe I can. I think that one was in 2019. Uh, okay. You said it was 2020. Uh, oh, uh, it was a year oh. after the rubber duck. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll verify it right now because I have it here. Okay. I always, yeah, I always so get the, day, the years mixed up on the two. Hold on. When you do that, I can uh, search the weather. Uh, yeah, Bruja was was weird to me, but it again, it looks like the same object. You know, I think they're in black hot. Oh uh, yeah, you're right. 2020. It's 2020. What what day? February 3rd, 2020. Okay. I'll, I'll check it out. Uh, talk amongst yourselves quickly. Or well, it could be some kind of advanced, you know, thing that cartel is using. <laughs> they do yeah, some, very... some, some that usually moves fast generates heat. Even the air has friction in it. So this is a cold object if we're going by what we're looking at, which is odd. What I tried to look for was, as it was running through the vegetation, that the vegetation actually covers it a little. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at a small screen, so I can't really see it very well. And I was also trying to pull some sensor data off of it, but I couldn't really see anything. Um, I might be able to get you the original file if you want. Yeah, then I would be able to uh, just kind of look at it and break it down by the sensor itself. But again, you know, you notice that the uh, sensor operator is not zooming in on the targeted object. Um, never seen the the object the polarity change. Never seen him contrast the sensor. They just kind of just like mesmerize and and mesmerize for 30, 40 minutes. That's kind of crazy. That's not really censoring. That's like you're you're just there for the ride and you're not trying to trying to figure it out that's well from 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 what, what from what my my source tells me it says they see a lot of unexplained things out there like a lot of things and and these people you know i mean you got to remember too you know this is these subjects are very taboo so nobody really wants to come forward to talk about them because then they start thinking that there's something wrong with them you know right but you know you you're talking about stories that are you know go further than just ufos you know or anything like that or unknowns you know, you have experiences with other things as well, you know, like, uh, you know, I've, I've heard stories 
that have come from them that involved ghosts and apparitions, you know, and things that really freak them out. You know what I'm saying? So there's, there's more to it than just that. You know what I mean? But um, he says they definitely do see a lot of weird things that they can never really explain. And as a matter of fact, I, um, I'm not sure. I, I mention this all the time, but you know of the incident that occurred um, in February of this year in Tucson with the uh, the drone that was being chased by DHS and um, the local police. Yeah, that one's crazy, man. The the green light that they that they followed in their helicopter for like an hour or something crazy. Yeah, it was seventy five miles they chased it. Well, wow. chased it for seventy five miles. This thing was upwards of ten thousand feet. It was literally flying circles around the helicopter. You know what I mean? Like literal circles. You know, and it's like, how, what does that? And I'm think, I'm saying to myself, okay, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. If it was a drone or a quadcopter, do you not think that the rotation of the blades and the disturbance of the air would throw that thing out of whack. You know what I mean? Especially being that close, the vicinity of the, uh, of the chopper. If it was below the chopper by far, they would, you know, it would push that drone down. The, the, the airflow goes down on those blades. Uh, I haven't seen the video, so I can't say, but, um, the one yeah, thing there's no this, video. Yeah, it's it's uh, audio. it's all audio. Oh, they, audio. It's like a yeah, they have like all the radio chatter between the police uh, helicopter or DHS helicopter. Um, it's pretty interesting. I, I you know flying, especially out west in the open and everything. There's a lot of you know military stuff going on that we're probably not privy to. But I've also been lasered by civilians. I've seen drones go through my altitude in my aircraft and even through. Uh, you know, restricted airspace, uh, MOAs, military operating areas, because civilians just don't, they don't care. Some of them yeah. don't, you know, they just, they, I got this cool drone and some of these drones are fast. I've, I've had a DGI tailwind going 30 miles an hour. I thought I was going to lose it. So you can do a lot with drones. There's a lot of hobbyists who build a lot of drones out there. Um, but what's odd about these two objects is, is that there's no heat source. That's, that's, that's the killer. Uh, what was the time on that one, Andy, on the Bruja? Do you know the time? Uh, 2100. 2100 Z. Hold on. Uh, hold on. 20, it just says 21. Actually, I don't know if you can see it. It looks like it's at night. I mean, that's really my impression. No, it is, it, it is at night. That looks like 2100. But it doesn't say Z, so that makes me think they have it in local, actually. That's right. It may be, if it's it may not, be local for DHS. Yeah, it looks because the, all the other ones, it says Z when it's in Zulu. So uh, my guess is it's local because it looks like it's at night. Yeah, it, it was at night. Right. It was taking. So the weather, it looks like it was cloudy in Tucson. Uh, it's 51 degrees. Uh, and seven to eight not or seven to eight miles per hour wind out of the west northwest. So uh, that's interesting. So not that high a wind, you know. That thing's moving pretty fast. So yeah, Bruja is weird, man. I don't know. They they seem to look the same uh, or very similar to me. Um, well, yeah, I, I got I got an interesting uh, little story. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can get this individual to talk to me at least. But um, I have a follower who's, um, whose aunt is actually from that reservation that you see at the beginning of the footage. That's the Tohono O'odham uh, Indian Reservation. And uh, she showed her the footage, and she claimed to, have, to know exactly what it was, and they call it a bean, believe it or not. And that, you know, she was trying to try, she was going to try to, you know, get a little more information from her, but I haven't heard, you know, if, if she got in touch with her or not, but... Uh from what she said is that they, you know, the locals there, the natives uh, consider it a being and that she's, they've seen it or she's at least has seen it before, which was interesting when I heard that because I wasn't expecting, you know, anything like that. A but, being, uh, so you said a, like a being, B-E-I-N-G? Yeah, that's being, what the, the native, living native, native locals, yeah, consider, at least from what she says, they consider it a being. So that was that was interesting. That's why I wanted to see if I can get to speak to her to see which you know what story she had. But but a, like been... a living, breathing being, or like yeah, a spirit like, being. 
I mean, I, it could it could be a spirit being because I know Native Americans are big on that, you know. Uh -huh. but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, and the, there are stories out there that you know claim these, uh, in the, you know, these Native Americans or at least certain tribes still do get visited by certain beings. So it's hard to say, you know. Right. Yeah. No, because because the only reason I, I would say that is again because. If we're living and breathing, we're generating radiation. We're uh, uh, providing uh, emissivity from our bodies, and we're uh, radiating that heat. So this thing is showing up cold. And again, the only thing that really shows up cold, especially at a 50 degrees, is perfect. It's going to cool that object down, and it's going to make it pop as a cold object. Uh, when I was uh, flying gunships, I would love 10 degrees Celsius weather because that makes people stand out from everything else. Mm -hmm. So that's like a perfect weather. And then for this to be the opposite where it stands out because it's cold, that's a unique signature. Uh, yeah, the cold, the temperature is just is crazy. The, yeah, man. The more I look at Bruja, I'm just like, I don't know how to explain this one. Let's... Uh, it's very interesting. Let's thanks for the super chat, Walker Dale. Thank you, man. He says, Hey guys, I had a good question. I had this question too. Is Dave Falch okay? I heard he's off Twitter and face and Facebook. Is it related to his work on the tuber duck? <laughs> Tube. uh, you you, you want to answer this, Dave? Or I mean he may have missed the um, beginning, I guess. Yeah. No, no, everything's fine. Um, I just have to reformat my channel because some person or persons saw some stuff and um, suggested that I do that, and it was in my best interest. We'll just leave it at that. Awesome, but so but you're back out of here, man. I, I I really appreciate it. It does take a lot of risk, um, you, you know. Going, I I respect anybody who goes online and 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 voices their opinion, you know, in a in a reasonable manner. Um, so thank you for being here and thanks to these, to the sources, man. I don't know, you know, we kind of been ragging on the operators a little bit. Um, but you know, these guys are out there for days at a time every night. Um, and, and a lot of times I think maybe they don't have the, the actual systems even connected, you know, to, to do the polarity changes, to work on the, get the focus, uh, and all that. So I don't know. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Uh, you know, is there any chance, is the source, is he ever going to come out? Is there, is there any chance? We'll get to yeah. talk to him one day. Yeah, he he uh, he's well. From what he told me, it, it'll probably be within the next like month or two or something like that. Oh, really? He'll okay. Be, you know, he'll be comfortable to come forward, but um, yeah, definitely will. Oh, excellent. Okay, that's great. And, and so you mentioned uh, that one, uh, you know, woman. Any other any other leads? You know, uh, any other DHS? You said there's a bunch of stuff in there. You know, any of these guys willing to 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 talk? Well, I mean, well, that's the that's the uh, the goal is to try to get these individuals to not be afraid to come forward. You know, at least you know, hopefully, if somebody sees it and and it, it kind of motivates them to bring out you know their footage. Um, I don't want. Well, there's one thing I'm going to mention. I don't want to. I I'm I'm not gonna. How can I put it? I'm not gonna hype this up until I see it. But um, I I did catch some wind about an Apache helicopter video that uh, captured something. So I'm not going to hype it, but you're going <laughs> to hype it. It's, it's, it's what I was told. So I'm, I'm just waiting on that to see, um, to see what comes of it. Um, and I'm going to do the exact, listen, I, I don't regret doing this, doing the way I don't regret doing what I did and how I did it. I, I would do it again, exactly the same way because you know, instead of me just dumping this out there and assuming and then and, and throwing, oh, yeah, that it's a UFO and blah, blah, blah. I held on to this for four fucking months. OK. And yeah. gave this to individuals to to to, to analyze. You know, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, I would get little tidbits of information which would validate that, OK, the object is considered anomalous. The object is emitting zero heat. The object is rotating in a like weird fashion. I actually posted an image of that on my Instagram. Um, so, you know, before I jumped into anything, I made sure 
that I had some kind of information from another source at least. And, you know, thank God it was individuals that I knew, you know, I could trust in regards to that because I knew that they've done good work before, especially with the Aguadilla footage. They broke that down very well, like 200 and something pages. Hmm. So, you know, that's why I was excited, you know. And the yeah. thing, too, is, you know, people have to understand, you know, I hyped it up because I know what I had. You know, I know what the footage the I knew how that the footage was important because it did definitely show something that was unidentifiable. You understand? Yeah. One you, so you're you're referencing is that SCU basically? I went, yeah. SCU. Say that? Yeah. So I that Aguadilla report it was uh, just awesome. You know, I really yeah. liked it, uh, and it was two hundred plus pages. You know, it took many many months for them to really dial in to get it to a scientific level. Um, so I, I'm excited actually to see what comes up. This is kind of a good kind of last question here from H Hunsley, <laughs> you know, John Hunsley, man, I like this guy. Uh, okay. Do we all agree that we have proved beyond reasonable doubt that the rubber duck is something floating on the breeze at 4,000 feet above the ground? Oh, does everybody agree? I don't know. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I did the, the whole uh, <laughs> I, you didn't see it, Andy, I but I, I made the, the two DCS videos. You know, if you go back and just kind of watch through that, I think it makes it obvious. Um, but you know. I actually, there's one thing. I, I'm sorry, Dave. I know you were going to say something really quick. I'm not going to agree that it was floating because I know okay. this individual. And he's kind of a pain in my ass. Um, <laughs> yeah, just to throw that out there. Um, but I don't agree it was floating in the wind. No. It was, it was also, and, and my, and my, my yeah. defense to that is – the go fast footage, which I uh, I posted in a, a private chat with Dave and the source. And when you look at the go fast footage, it almost starts off in the exact same manner. The back, the the the, the background, I guess you could say, the, the scenery in the back is still at the moment where the object comes into view. You understand what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. So it was the almost the exact same way it started when the object in the rubber, you know, the rubber duck came into view. So yeah. that means it, it had some kind of motion to it. You know what I mean? Not just floating in breeze, you know what I mean? Well, it, that's what gives us the length of the video was really the strength of this video um, for me. And it is so long, you know, like I couldn't download it. You know, I mentioned to Carl, like I, I tried several times to download this thing. So for me, it was really the length. It's just so much data in there, you know? So I, I think I maybe uh, I would have to say floating. I would have to agree with John because it, it, if it was propelling itself up, or, you know, if it was actually pushing something down, I think you would have to create heat, uh, like Dave saying. So I, I just don't see how it could be a drone, you know? I don't see how it could be a drone. If Now, and it, it didn't shift speeds either. So it didn't go fast or it didn't go slow or it stayed steady, just like something that would fly in the wind, right? Imagine blowing the little dandelion seeds and they fly away. They never go faster or slower until they fall to the ground. This thing, this object never, never change speeds at all and now if you think about that actually i'm glad you brought that up because if the object is at the altitude that it was at the wind is not going to be stable like that throughout 40 minutes you know what i'm saying there's going to be some kind of dust or something that will you know you would you would be able to see it in the object if, if that was the case so like you said the 40 minutes is a big deal because you're seeing that nothing changes with this object as it's you know, in the sky, besides the fact that it's rotating as well. So, you know, and that's another thing. What do you, I mean, how do you explain that rotation? You know, like, so, so if it's tethered and, and the parachute opens, cause I, I'm a, I don't think it's on a balloon. I think it's on a parachute. It's, it's <laughs> naturally after the balloon bursts, after it ascended, it's going to spin. If you look at uh, weather balloons, that is a problem that they have. And there's been some studies of, you know, like college research teams trying to stabilize their sensors as they descend after the uh, ascent to whatever altitude they were going to go to. So it's fairly common for weather balloon equipment underneath of it to spin. Also, if you look at, um, uh, it, you know, the little if you throw something up on a, on a string and there's going to be some wind as it's floating or flying or whatever, it's going to spin. I think a good example of that is, is when you watch 
rescue helicopters pick people up. When those people get picked up, they don't go straight up most of the time. They're spinning. And that's why you have the engineer on top. He stabilizes them and then brings them in. Okay, so uh, that's a good, you know, theory. But then what? how does it explain that it stays relatively in the same, you know, height? For forty and, minutes, not dropping. And yeah, and honestly, yeah, that's, that's I can. The million dollar question, obviously. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, I zoomed in and motion stabilized this frame by frame on the other one that we watched a little bit ago for like ten hours the other day. Never, never once did I see. I mean, you see indication of you know grass on the road and the ruts, and there's even spots where you see cows and you can see the horns and tails on the cows. Uh, Never at any time do you see any indication of a, a rope, a string, a tether, a parachute. I don't know. Like, it's just a solid, cold object for 20 minutes straight, every single frame, going across other very fine details that are supposedly 4,000 feet below it on the ground. So if we can see detail like bushes and shrubs and cattle guards and horns and tails on cows on the ground, why do we not see? Where's the rope? Where's yeah. the tether? Where's the parachute? Yeah. I don't understand that. It so reminds gonna... me of, sorry, one, I'll just one point. Um, yeah. It reminds me of Ryan Graves, you know, out on the East Coast. What they were saying is when they tried to video um, on FLIR, the little, the, the contacts they were picking up is it looked like a flashlight pointed at them, you know, like it was just like a, an orb or, or some point source of IR light, you know, that's kind of what I was thinking it basically kind of reminded me of that, or I, I thought of that as, as I was looking at it. So the hmm. only other thing I could think of, and this is like way in left field. Um, when I used to fly out in the desert, no kidding at five, 6,000 feet, those plastic bags are up there with us, believe it or not. Uh, cause the heat generated thermals, they pick them up. Now, obviously this is at night and these things float <laughs> forever. We used to call them the national bird of this one country cause we were surprised that they were up, but that, I mean, that is a far fetch, right? That is way out in left field. I mean, and, and you could use that, you know, as a theory, but then again, when you look at the object itself, you know, on the, you know, stabilized, you would, yeah, you would see that, a you know, a bag would make. You know, all these crazy maneuvers again, because you're in the middle of the desert, you know what I'm saying? There's wind blowing from every direction. There's no trees to slow anything down. So the motion would be obvious. You know what I mean? So that 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 to me would is, is what it explains that it's not a balloon or. Yeah. And the only the only other thing I could think of, it's, it's in a valley, maybe. And, you know, wind gets funneled into valleys. Right. So. It may be getting some extra kick if it's in a valley and the winds are pushing down that valley. That may help explain some things. Uh, 15 knots movement. 40 minutes is a long time. 40 minutes is a long time for a crew to look at it, not manipulate their sensor, and not identify it. <laughs> That's the crazy part. It, yeah. That, I don't, yeah. I, I, well, crazy. thanks, Mick West, for being here. I, Good video you, you made on this, man. Uh, did they explain why the GPS on-screen data was removed? I saw a couple other questions uh, in the chat as well. Any, you want to take this, Andy? Yeah, actually, that was uh, at the request of the source, um, given the uh, location of where the plane was at. He didn't want that to... He was, he was afraid that, you know, it was going to create some kind of a situation, so he requested that the that the location and everything be blocked out. Yeah, I could see how the, maybe they don't want, you know, to give away their track position. Uh, we got this. This was actually from SC just, and so you know, SCU does yeah. have the original, so they are aware of, you know, and I, I actually, it was it was a concern from them as well when they realized, you know, the location, the exact location. Um, yes. But that was that that was the reason why. Okay, yeah. So requested by the source. It, will it ever come out that data, or is it? It'll be S SCU has it. Uh, I'm I'm not a hundred I'm not a hundred percent sure as to you know whether or not SCU is going to release the the original raw file with that. Um, 
I'd have to speak to the source to see if they came to some kind of agreement on that. But um, I'd have to I'd have to find out. And let you know. Wow, let's look at this. Thank you, man. Thank you, C Cyprian. Uh, wouldn't the metal box warm up enough after 40 minutes to be much closer to ambient temperature and not appear so white if it was a Mateo probe? I think, uh, there, there is not enough. The uh, object would warm up very slowly, depending on how cold the, the, the object was already cold soaked. And you have to imagine um, how cold it was that night. It's flowing in open air in the breeze so it's not going to warm up like you would warm up it's going to be a while before it does warm up uh how long just depends on how much cold soak it was how the surrounding air how cold it was humidity in the air and then that the metal the com uh composure the, or what the metal box is made of what type of metal and everything awesome uh yeah awesome thanks uh this is from trevor good to see you man trevor mays Thermals affect parachutes as well. So he's on, he likes the, the parachute idea, uh, which seems crazy. Let's see. <laughs> That's not crazy. Yeah, good idea. <laughs> Let's see. Can we, uh, we should find a video of somebody filming like a parachutist or a skydiver with a flare. I mean, uh, it seems like you would see the cables. It seems like you'd see the ropes or strings or anything. Well, actually, if, 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 I mean, if you think about it too, um, you know, if, if, if it was a shoot, then the, the payload wouldn't be that close to the shoot itself because then it would interfere with the, you know, the, the, the drag, right? And it would be dropping down faster because those two objects are literally like right next to each other. So, I mean, that's what, that's what I would think. Uh, well, when, when you, and I think you missed it. We had a picture of the balloon. You could actually see that there were two boxes. The top box would be like the GPS box for its location. And then the bottom box would be the payload, whatever they were sensing at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have it right here. Uh, that's this thing. Oh, I, I've seen those before. <clears throat> yeah. So if the airplane is up above filming down below at this target, wouldn't we see even more of the tether or see the balloon from, or would, how would the balloon be above the plane? Uh, I'm not sure how that works still. So Because that I, doesn't look very long to me in this picture. The, the I'm I'm thinking the balloon is already gone. It, it's already ascended. It's on the descent. The balloon is gone. As the balloon rises up in the atmosphere, it gets so high it's going to pop. And then as it falls, the parachute opens for the descent. And the uh, explanation I can give you is that the again I'll go back to the sensor operator. He never changed his field of view. So what we're really only seeing is half of that tether. We're only seeing up to where it shows, like where it says uh, parachute or something. So, you so how? We, I guess my question is, how long from this angle of filming would the tether have to be to not even see the shoot in any of twenty minutes of footage? Yeah, would it have to be like a, a like a five hundred foot, thousand foot long tether? Or how? I mean, it seems like if you're that far up above filming down, the tether going up to a parachute would be insanely long. Why would you put a parachute like a thousand feet above? The payload. Yeah, it seems like I, it would only be like twenty or thirty feet above the payload. I, 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 yeah, I don't. I don't think it's that long. It's less than uh, sixty feet. And um, so, why what, isn't in? So why because, isn't in the frame? Because when you're flying the airplane and a guy is and the pilot is making that turn, the sensor is looking at a slant angle. So for for the aircraft to see that parachute, let's say the parachute's up here, he's going to have to push his sensor up. If you look at his sads through the whole uh, video, his sads never really go that high. They're always down about negative 20 degrees. And that just tells me that he's not looking level. He's always looking down. So the object itself, obviously, in this picture, you can tell is below the aircraft. And right now, the aircraft is on okay. the back side of the object getting ready to turn on to the uh, other side as it completes its orbit. So we're seeing the top of the parachute then, or the parachute's no, above the plane? The parachute so is above the sensor sight line. I see. Okay, uh, that's, I mean, like I said, that's a, that's above a good the zoom in. It's a good theory, but it still doesn't explain how it stays in the ex exact height, you know, for 40 exactly. minutes. And uh, let's not forget, if it was, they would have just found where it landed and located it, and that was it, you know? So that that you know, people people 
people tend to forget that, you know, and I mentioned it, that, you know, this, these pilots saw it. If it was a parachute, they would have sent GPS location, you know, to, to go pick up whatever it was that dropped. But the fact that it, it never dropped is. So, so, I'm sorry. Did, did your source ever tell you at what time did they leave the object? What phase was it in? Um, was it still uh, airborne at that time? Did it already impact the ground? No, it never impacted the ground. So, but they never, no, no, it, no, no. They never saw it impact the ground. Um, so they may have what, you know, what we call bingled out or jokered out, you know, uh, they bingled out for fuel. They might've been, uh, you know, already low on gas or, they had a higher priority mission that they didn't deem this object uh, of interest, which, uh, you know, in military jargon happens all the time. I'm, a I'm actually, um, I'm, I'm trying to see if he can get the individual who's, or the individuals that were on the plane that day to come forward, or at least, you know, give a statement in regards to it because um, he does know who they are. Um, so he's, I, I'm actually attempting to get, you know, to get information from them at this moment. So I'm hoping I can get that soon. Um, there were some questions in the chat about if it's down a valley or if we can get the track direction. Let me find it. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but basically it's here. It's This is uh, at minute 51. So Andy gave the coordinates at minute 51, the airplane is here. Uh, and then at minute 918, the airplane's here, right? So only 5.1 five nautical or regular miles. Uh, and then you can see the actual terrain here. So it's, I guess it's kind of on the west side of this, uh, this, I guess it's not in a valley, but the uh, west a ridge. side of a, a, a ridge. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So let's see. So, um, you know, go ahead. So with a parachute, right? If, if the, if this is on the west side of that ridge line and, and the winds are coming out of the west, oh, sorry. The, the winds would go up the side of the ridge and it would help keep the parachute afloat. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> the parachute. <laughs> Chris and his laugh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just throwing it 40 out. 40 minutes. What, I, what, I mean, I guess I'm awesome. I, honestly, I, I, I would think it would go, be going up and down more. Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm no parachute expert, I guess. Um, so. Um, uh, that's what yeah, we need exactly. the skydiver. He, he would be able to tell you the aerodynamics of a chute and. How well, I've actually, works. I've actually jumped out of one, so I, I kind of have a little idea of it too. <laughs> but um, I mean, I, I just want to say this: I'm, I'm actually glad, I'm, I'm glad that you guys are doing this because, you know, it's like Chris said, I, I got a lot of crap for this video when I posted it, you know, and it's like it really threw me back because, you know, number one, I didn't claim it to be anything anomalous. I said, I mean, like, well, in, in anomalous in the sense of UFO, like ET, um, but. The fact that no one actually was willing to analyze the footage and just immediately just started going at it and then just, I mean, uh, some hard, it was some pretty bad things. I had my, yeah, like I said before, I had my freaking, uh, like my home address put out there, my work address put out there. It was like, why, you know, like we're all supposed to be doing this together to get to the answer. You know what I'm saying? So even if this was something that was, uh, from from this planet or or created by us, that's fine. At least we get to the bottom of it. You know what I'm saying? But to bash people for no reason just because it wasn't to their expectations is like, come on, you, you're, you're going about it all wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like this, what we're doing is what it was supposed to be like. You understand what I'm saying? Different opinions, different views, trying to come up with, with, with an answer, you know? And if we don't come up with an answer, then we're left with, what is it? You know what I'm saying? But that reaction, the, the the initial reaction that 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 I got was it just threw me back because it, it 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 showed me that none of us are ready for this yet, absolutely not. Because if we're ready to kill each other and we're all out for the same answers. It's like, what are we doing? You know. I talked to some of our uh, my patrons about it, and you know they were basically saying that it's just the, uh, after the Corbell videos and after all the hype, um, you know they're they they just want the the high def, you know, it's clearly a silver metal saucer. You know, the bar's just been raised so high. You know, if th that I guess that that's the point. You know, so they're waiting 
for so long and it, it you know, caused and you, we may never even get that. We may never ever get that. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't, I personally don't ever see anything like that ever coming out. I mean, I, I hear that there's footage from 20 feet away from a, a craft that made the pilot crap himself, literally. But yeah. where is it? That's just a story, you know? So mm -hmm. th what I would say to those individuals is don't compare what I put out there to two seconds of footage dropped by Corbell or whatever of a really, really, really crappy little, you know, video. I give you 40 full minutes of an object that you can study, that you can try to figure out. It is plenty of information, you know what I'm saying, to actually come to your own conclusion instead of a two second or two minute video of a dot. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's my defense to this. Like, don't even put me on that level. <laughs> I mean, th those three videos are awesome. I mean, the A10 video is amazing. The the Bruja, I think, is like Dave said. I think that that is, you know, could be my favorite as well. Um, and then this one as well. So, I mean, we appreciate everything. I guess kind of final question here. Uh, it, this is kind of what it came down to me. I don't, you know, there's no heat signature. So how can it, it, it can't be a drone to me, but it's 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 somehow floating. It's cold or or whatever it's doing. So, I guess this last question, we'll answer this one as a group and then and then we'll we'll end the stream here. Uh, but from Gavin Harrington, what about a drone with mylar balloon and a payload attached? Balloon to save on battery in addition payload also makes heat signature from the drone and drone is used sporadically for direction. I don't know. That's uh, that's kind of the only thing I could think of is that little ball on top. Could that be a a, a, a balloon? But then how could it carry, you know, I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I posted the I don't I think you would. information. Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Yeah, spoke Not Andy, I guess. I know what you think. No, go ahead, Dave. Let's go with that. Uh, I don't Michael, think you want anything attached to a drone, uh, especially any kind of string, because of the spinning blades. That drone's going to come down. You're definitely not going to want to do that. Um, it, it's a uniform cold signature which is the weirdest thing. If it was hot, then there could be multiple explanations for this, but that's the whole essence of this video. It's a cold, uh, multi-object thing that's rotating around. It's, I, don't th I don't think you can explain this one with balloons or balloons or drones. It's just, yeah, that's my personal opinion. Excellent. So we got one FLIR expert, uh, and then we lost the other one. He just disappeared. I think, I bet his phone died. He was on his phone. Damn it. Uh -oh. We're so close. I, I think <laughs> if I have to guess, I'm going to say he thinks it's a parachute uh, that's carrying a payload. <laughs> no, I think he, that's See, I think it's something thing. like, wait a minute, other side. I think it's something like this. Where am I? On the opposite way. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I can't see it. What are you um, pointing at? I'm thinking at? outside the box. No, like not anthropomorphically. I'm thinking just whatever. I, I think we nailed it in. I'm really curious to see what SCU comes up with. Um, if they can can make it. The only thing I could possibly think of is that it's the guy is somehow focused on the ground. The sensor is close. It's focused closer to the ground. And it's somehow it's out of focus enough that it's creating some sort of Bokeh effects or, or something like that. I mean, that's that's the only thing. But it, I don't know. It still seems, it does seem anonymous anomalous uh, to me. I don't know. Uh, sorry. And I just talked with Dave up as a, as the main guy. <laughs> we just watched Dave as I talk. Sorry about that, guys. My brain is wearing out, man. We got to shut. It's, okay. it's midnight here, man. I'm, I live in Portugal. It's 12, 1220. All right. Uh, so any, Carl, man, thanks for being on here. Thank you so much, brother, for for being here. I, I hope so much uh, to see you in the future, man. Anything you want to say uh, at all? Where, where do we find you? Your, your new page, your new YouTube channel? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I'm doing a lot of out in the field stuff on the channel called Carl the Crusher and then Carl Vibes, where I do a lot of shows like this, podcast interviews and everything. Uh, I think my opinion in the end on this is it remains unidentified. It's an unidentified flying object. Whether you like it or not, we can't identify what it is. I feel like it being balloons or some kind of a payload doesn't quite make sense to me after over 10 hours of going frame by frame through the thing. I never once saw a tether, a rope, a cable, any indication of a parachute. And I think if it was a parachute dropping, 
the amount of time that it's on screen doesn't make any sense for the elevation that it would be at. I think it would have hit the ground within 20 minutes if it was on a parachute or you would have seen some sort of indication crossing a dark background, uh, some kind of a line, string, anything like that, or parachute just doesn't make any sense to me. So to me, it's still completely unidentified and really compelling and, and worth analyzing, if anything, uh, bringing attention to the Department of Homeland Security and what these guys are struggling with there on the border. And shout out to all of those guys and their hard work to try and uh, do a good job there. So that's my thoughts. Awesome, man. Yeah, thank you, brother. So uh, yeah, and then let's see, we got Michael back. Sorry, uh, had some uh, technical difficulties. Yeah. Yeah. My IT. Cool, man. So uh, what's your final take? So what is- my final take is I believe what it is a, um, a balloon. Uh, what you're seeing is uh, the equipment on a t- tether. Uh, you don't see the parachute that's on top. It is spinning, which is uh, e- described as normal for some of these uh, balloons after the, the parachutes are open. And uh, I'm just really surprised that the sensor operator for 30, 40 minutes didn't struggle to try to ID the object. But they did give it a lot of birth. They gave it uh, about uh, six, you know, between three and a half to six mile birth. So they they were pretty safe. Um, There is an incident where an aircraft once has crashed because it ran into equipment from a weather balloon. Happened in Russia in the 70s. but yeah, that's what I think it is. I, I, I think it's uh, a descending equipment, whether it's from NOAA, military, whoever. It's odd that it, it, it did fly for that long. It's also weird that it's two o'clock in the morning. But uh, again, I find it weird that the crew did not fight to try to understand what the object was. All right, excellent. Uh, yeah, thanks again, Michael. And thanks for coming online, man. Thanks for, yep. for putting, thanks for putting inviting your face me. out there. It's I totally respect it, man. So thank you so much. I hope, you know, you, you'll be hopefully an example for more guys to come on. You know, it's great. It's just so awesome getting your, uh, your perspective on all this stuff, man. You know, this, you know, this inside out. Um, so thank you, man, for being here. Um, and then, uh, the myth, the legend, Andy. So thank you brother as well. Um, so any final points you want to say any, any, any other surprise releases coming out or anything? <laughs> Nothing yet, but I'm working on it. Um, no, I, I just, like I said, want to thank you guys for doing this. Um, I just want to make it a point that, you know, when footage comes out, rather it be from, you know, individuals like me or Corbell or anything that, you know, the work get put into analyzing the footage before, you know, people try to attack or, or, uh, demonize or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Because it just makes, it, it adds more, um, I guess you could say joke to the subject because we can't act like adults and actually do what needs to be done to get the answer. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I want to thank you guys for that. And, you know, regardless of what opinions everyone has, and you know, no, no matter what you put out there, no one's going to be happy with it. They're going to want to see literally ET through the window driving, you know what I'm saying? So, just be glad with what comes out and hopefully the footage pushes or opens the door more for other things to come forward so that way we can get to the bottom of it and get the answer we need. Yeah. I don't think, uh, I mean, people should understand it takes a ton of work, man, all this stuff. And like I said, Andy, you know, you haven't, your video is not monetized. It's not making any money. Um, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, and so, yeah keep it coming hopefully this is a uh, he, because he's super chatted last thing magician joshua thank you man uh thanks chris have you all listened to lieutenant ryan graves latest interview on a podcast interesting stuff and has anyone listened to that by any chance not yet but i'll look into it okay we'll check it out man yeah i, I did talk to him lately and uh yeah so i think we should be pretty excited oh all right I'll keep my mouth shut all right guys <laughs> <laughs> thanks again for being here everybody uh, as always, please uh, like the video. I have one more little, uh, basically how this video is uh, probably going to end. Let's see how it goes. Thanks for being here. Uh, if you want to support me on Patreon, support the channel, uh, you can go to um, patreon.com, Chris Lado. Love all the Patreons, man. You guys are awesome. And everybody super chatted. And everybody for being here. Thanks, Mick West, man, for being here. Um, you know, I think we're all trying to get to the to the bottom of this. And I think you're... Uh, 
your videos have been really good on point lately. So thanks, man, as well. All right, guys, that's it. What do you think is going to happen here? <laughs> now I have to watch crash it. it. You know? <laughs> I'm flying from the side, right? So it's hard. You can't tell. You get confused. So then I was like, how close can I get? <laughs> um, you chasing the tic-tac? Yeah, but then, you know, you always crash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks Thank again, guys. everybody. Have Thank a you. great night. Good night, guys. Thanks for having me. See you guys. Bye-bye.